Hello and welcome to EngPhys 2 p 4 This is going to be our major content lecture number one, going over the first set of lecture notes. So this is a one Physics 1D review with Flex PDE and Maple. Uh, this is going to be covering largely the topics from that course, from your first year mechanics physics course here at McMaster Physics 1D. And because these are review topics for this course, we're going to go very fast, looking at things from a second year perspective and, uh, and really just pointing you into the direction of the notes in case you want to read more or do more review of that stuff. Okay, so let's get going then. Uh, why study mechanics in the first place? Well, mechanics is pretty awesome. It's about how stuff moves. You can use that, among other things, to land, uh, land probes on, uh, on comets, do all kinds of crazy stuff like that, figure out why bridges would sometimes collapse and resonate due to, due to resonance, understand where the forces are on airplanes or in nuclear reactors or what causes these sorts of stress things that make um, make light bend in weird ways, why you need these joints in bridges to stop the bridge from cracking in the winter, and then about how, um, how beams can be used to have resonance either for good or for bad. I'm going to post a link to this. Check out this engineer guy video on how a quartz watch works for a fantastic application of a lot of this stuff we're going to cover in 2P04. One thing before we go much further is to make sure that you are looking at this in web layout, which you can do by downloading a copy of this rather than looking at it online in Teams or in, uh, or in Avenue maybe. And looking at it with the navigation pane open here that allows you to jump quickly from one topic to the next way easier much better quality of life stuff going on there so first off review of first year mechanics physics and measurement okay the three fundamental physical quantities are length mass and time and in the si system the si system actually has more quantities than this but these are the ones we're concerned with in mechanics uh, these are meters kilograms and seconds the prefixes indicate uh, certain powers of 10 used with these, and we'll see the prefixes down here. So we've got like kilo, mega, giga, tera, and these are just actual powers of, of 10 to the something. So these major ones are 10 to a multiple of 3, like 10 to the 3 or 1,000 for kilo, kilo um, pronounced kila, if you're just kind of being quick about stuff like kilometer or using it maybe that's my canadian accent um 10 to the 6 is for mega that's million 10 to the 9 giga uh, then we also have the smaller quantities here milli milli 10 to the negative 3 micro 10 to the negative 6 nano 10 to the negative 9 and there's all the way down to um yocto defined and uh, yada defined on the on the large scale things one thing to note is that in computers these are not quite the same so kilo a kilobyte in a computer is not exactly a thousand bytes it's a power of two which is close to that so in a in a computer you use two to the power of 10 which gives you um, 1,024, which is close to 1,000 to be a kilobyte, and then it's all powers of 2 on from there. So 2 to the 20 is mega in computer language, which ends up being close to a million because it's 2 to the 10 times 2 to the 10, so about 1,000 times about 1,000. That's why things are slightly um, not working out exactly the same if you look at something on your computer. So imagine we go into this, um, we look at this file stuff here, and you see assignment this assignment zero file from a previous year of 2P04 is 55 kilobytes. But if we look at the properties of this, you can see that 50, that it's actually, I guess, 54.4 kilobytes, but the size it's taking up this much actual hard drive space. Um, but that 56 kilobytes is not 56,000 bytes, it's 57,344 bytes. This is not because the computer is bad at rounding. It's because 56, um, let's see, we'll take 56 times 1024 and see what we get there using maple as our calculator, 57,344. Um, so that's where that comes from. In a, in a computer, kila uh, is not exactly 1,000. It's a power of 2, 2 to the 10, which is close to 1,000. So physics is all set up so that you can keep the units in problems while you're solving them. And here's an example of a way to do that and have the units actually cancel and help you solve the problem itself. So suppose a car has a, 
has 20 inch diameter wheels and is traveling at 80 kilometers per hour and the motor is moving at a thousand is rotating at a thousand at 2000 rotations per minute rpm find the ratio of the motor's shaft rotation to wheel rotations what you might call the wheel to engine gear ratio uh okay so here's how you th can think through this every time the wheels do one revolution first we're going to just think through one part of it not sure with a so with a a big word problem like this, lots of information, not sure where to start maybe, you can just uh, write out some things you do know and see if that helps you focus and see where you're at. Every time the wheels do one revolution, the car travels one wheel circumference forward. So we can use this to relate the velocity to the wheel RPM. Um, they didn't tell us what the wheel RPM was. We know what the uh, what the motor RPM is, but maybe the wheel RPM is something we're going to need to figure out what the wheel to engine gear ratio is, like the ratio of those rotations. Okay, so the velocity being distance over time, it travels one wheel circumference forward per one wheel revolution. So we'll say the circumference is the distance it goes in the time that it takes for the wheel to revolve around once. So then um, wheel circumference is pi times its diameter. Let's call it big D there. And the time per revolution would be kind of like, let's put in another step here. So pi D over the, let's see, the time, like maybe the minutes per rev of the wheel, right? Minutes per rev of the wheel. But that is like saying when we're dividing by, div uh, we've got this division in the denominator here, we could flip this wheel revolution thing to the numerator and say that that should be the same as multiplying by the revolutions of the wheel per minute. Aha. Okay, then we could just call that the wheel RPM here and say we've got pi D times the wheel RPM is what we're looking for. All right. So next up, we can write down the thing we're looking for. The wheel to engine gear ratio, engine RPM over the wheel RPM would be engine RPM over this thing we just said was the wheel RPM. So that's V over pi D then, wheel circumference. And uh, now we sub in what we have, 2000 rotations per minute over 80 kilometers per hour. Uh, again, this divided by a division here lets us flip that wheel circumference up to the numerator. And that is 20 inches of the wheel diameter times pi. And it does that per rotation, right? So this is where the rotations are going to cancel here. Um, okay, so that's kind of like one circumference per rotation we really should be saying there. All right, next. Final ratio of this has to be unitless because we're looking for a ratio of one rotation to another rotation. So that means all of these things have to cancel. But how do we get them to cancel? Um, well, we can flip the divisions up to the numerator again and rearrange this. And uh, maybe I'll just do that. The rotations cancel. This is what I mean by like keeping the, the units in. So that rotations will cancel with this one. And uh, there we go. Yeah, so that's gone now. And this per hour here, kilometers per hour, we could move to an hours per kilometer using control E to turn it into um, non-italic in, uh, in math type here. Units should always be not in italic. So if you see something like H, that tells you it's some variable, like maybe a, a height of something, whereas H not italic tells you it's a unit so now we can see more easily that this might be talking about hours or something okay so what else we'll take this hours here per minute um this was not a real thing this was just an example of the unit there so that wasn't a thing that was there uh and then what else do we have we've got kilometers ah we've got an inches per kilometer yeah okay so this is what we have to figure out. Um, and this unit conversion here, we can do by a series of, of multiplying 
by things that are going to let them cancel out. So an hour is equal to what? You could say an hour is equal to 60 minutes. So we could directly replace that with 60 minutes and then let the minutes cancel. Another way to think about that is we could multiply it by something that is going to cancel out that hour symbol and also cancel out that minute symbol there too. So this hours per minute showed up in the calculation that we were doing and we separated it out from the rest of those numbers. Um, but we could multiply by the number one and not change anything. And a convenient number one to multiply by is 60 minutes per hour. Uh, control E is what I'm trying to type there. Yeah, control E to make it not italic. Okay, so 60 minutes per hour. This is one, right? Because the 60 minutes is an hour. Also should have a space, by the way, between the, the value and the units. Anyway, um, that's just using the NIST formatting guide to make things more clear there. So this is a one, and then we can cancel that with this and have the, and, and get rid of the the units that we didn't want there. Same thing with this distance one. Can you try to figure out how to do this one? It's a little more complicated. Um, so we need to get rid of the inches symbol and go to kilometers. So there's a bunch of different ways to do that. Let's first go with something that's going to get rid of inches and we can convert that uh, to maybe centimeters. So you might know that there's about 2.54 centimeters per inch and now the inches will be gone but we need to get rid of centimeters and kilometers so what else can we do we can get rid of centimeters by saying uh, one meter per hundred centimeters and then we need to get rid of the kilometers so we can also multiply this by something that's gonna get rid of meters and get rid of the kilometers. So a kilometer meter relationship. And we want the kilometers to be on the top to cancel with this one. So kilometers and meters, and the one that's gonna make it work is a thousand meters is one kilometer. Okay, so then this is the number one, this is the number one, this is the number one, and this is the number one. That's why we're allowed to do that. So we can say that this thing that we wrote out here in the second line is equal to this thing on the third line because all we did was um, was multiply by one in a couple of different spots, right? Multiplying by one shouldn't change anything, but the convenient thing about multiplying by one this time is that it's going to cancel out all those units. So the kilometers cancels with that one, inches cancel, centimeters cancel, meters cancel, minutes cancel, hours cancel, and we'll have something that's unitless at the end. Okay, so let's um, let's go ahead and calculate that and see what we get. First, I'll make this a little bit smaller with control one. That's just a, if you're gonna use math type, that's the command for that. Now we can go over here and, uh, and have 2000 over 80 times uh, pi times 20 times 60 times 2.54 over 100, and then again divided by 1,000. And we get 2.39, which is the same thing we calculated earlier. All right, some quicker questions. How many cubic millimeters are in a cubic meter? Uh, if you start off with a cubic meter, let's apply this approach. We'll put in the cubic meter is one meter cubed, right? So then we'll multiply by uh, a convenient one, which is going to convert this into millimeters inside, and we'll get a thousand millimeters all cubed. So the cube expands to each of these terms, right? To the 1,000 and to the millimeters. So this means it's 10 to the nine, a thousand cubed, millimeters cubed. So this, this is useful. This tells you that there's actually a billion cubic millimeters in a cubic meter. Let's think through that a second. Picture on a little cube that's one millimeter on each side. And then picture a bigger cube that's a meter on each side. And now picture putting a billion of those little cubes into that big cube. It's it, it's kind of tough to visualize that that's how many actually go into this, um, this thing. And we'll get across how tricky it is to scale volume things. Next one is about volume scaling a little bit more. Uh, a liter is an integer power of 10 meters on each side. 
So this means it's also an integer power of 10 cubic meters in volume. Now, how many meters on each side is it? What is this, this integer power of 10 that a liter is? One hint is to think of a two liter bottle of Coke. How big is this? A two liter bottle of Coke, so picture this, this is like the wider one there, the, the kind of big one. This is, um, well, let's think, is it one meter across? No. Is it one centimeter across? No. It's about 10 centimeters across, right? And so you imagine the bottom of this is roughly cubic and the top is roughly cubic. We're really acting like physicists now, right? So the bottom is kind of like a cubic decimeter. Um, that is 10th of a meter. And same thing with the top. So that tells you we're in the right ballpark. We're in the right range for how big a liter is. So a liter is a cubic decimeter. Now, how many kilograms are in a liter of water? One way to think about this is it's, it's also an integer multiple of kilograms per liter. And just think through this, how, how big is that, right? Like how, how heavy is this bottle of, does this two liter bottle of Coke feel? Does it feel like it's about two kilograms or does it feel like it's about 20 kilograms or does it feel like it's about um, 200 grams? Well, let's think this through. I'm not sure if you have much of a feeling for kilograms. Um, if you're, if you're, if you grew up in a, a backwards time like I did, where pounds were kind of more common to talk about, then you can um, you can think about it in terms of that. But hopefully you go with the kilogram way of thinking through things and, and lead positive change in the world. So yeah, a kilogram is the mass of one liter of water. Um, this also tells you how much a um, how much a one meter cube volume of water would have as its mass. Could you lift up a cubic meter of water? Um, no, not unless you are, um, unless you're Raimi maybe, then you might be able to do this. But anybody else, you cannot lift up uh, a cubic meter of water. So you can also use this to figure out how big one gram of water must be. And if one gram is one one thousandth of a kilogram and a kilogram is one liter in volume of water, then um, one gram must be a thousandth of a liter. So you could figure out how many, um, how many meters on each side that is too, by saying one one thousandth of a tenth of a meter on each side, and then bring the 10 to the negative three liters inside of this bracket, and that'll turn it into um, 10 to the negative two inside instead of 10 to the negative one inside. You can imagine doing that in two steps if you like. First, maybe expand this one out and then factor the six under the three, up to you. Anyway, uh, what you end up with is that it is a centimeter cubed. So one gram of water is a cubic centimeter. Having these things in mind are very helpful for figuring out, uh, get, getting a sense of how a lot of things are working or like the meaning of quantities that you're calculating. So how big is a cubic centimeter? How big is a gram of water? A lot of things have a density similar to water. So if you think about five grams of, um, of some kind of liquid that's mostly water-based, then that probably has a volume of about five centimeters by one centimeter by one centimeter. That's like the the size of the thing that we're talking about there. And that's hugely useful to have a feeling of so you can picture and kind of put um, put real quantities, real values, real meaning to these things you're calculating. All right, motion in one dimension. After a particle moves along the x-axis from some initial position to some final position, the displacement delta x is defined as the difference between those two positions. So that's what displacement is. It doesn't care about, remember, it doesn't care about how you got there, what the path was. Displacement is final position minus initial position. The average velocity is this displacement over time for the whole path. Instantaneous velocity is the limit of this as the time interval approaches zero. So at any instant in time, it ends up limiting to a derivative, dx by dt. This is um, not quite instantaneous speed. Speed is the total distance traveled, which doesn't care about like final and initial position so much. It looks at how far it actually went. So if it goes back and forth a lot, then the 
um, distance will be higher than the displacement. Displacement is only equal to distance if, um, well, if we're in one dimension, so the displacement's not a vector, and if the particle doesn't do any backtracking. In that situation, it never like changes its direction of motion, then the distance and displacement can be the same. Um, and the speed being the total distance divided by time, the average speed being that, uh, will be equal in magnitude to the average velocity. Velocity, again, is going to end up being a vector. So instantaneous speed, similarly, magnitude of instantaneous velocity. Average acceleration of a particle. Now, oh, actually, let's stop and, and think about this for a minute. Why is it that we had to do all of this rigmarole for calculating distance and everything to figure out what average speed was, but for instantaneous speed, it just ends up being magnitude of instantaneous velocity, right? Average speed isn't the magnitude of average velocity, right? Uh, the reason is because, remember, speed and velocity have the same magnitude if the direction doesn't change, because then displacement and distance can have the same magnitude. Really, distance is not a vector, so we don't have to say magnitude for that. But distance traveled is the same as the magnitude of displacement if the thing never changes direction. And in the limit that the time interval is, is zero, when we're taking a derivative here to get instantaneous velocity, there's not enough time for the direction to change, right? So because of that, with no change in the direction, you could imagine like instantaneous displacement is equal to instantaneous, uh, has, has to all be in a given direction. So the distance traveled over an instant is the magnitude of instantaneous displacement. And that's why instantaneous speed will just be the magnitude of instantaneous velocity. Okay. Okay. Average acceleration is the change in velocity, the total, the net change in velocity over the change in time that took place. That's average acceleration, given with this bar symbol on top. Uh, instantaneous acceleration, though, again, is this limit of average acceleration as the time interval approaches zero. So that ends up, again, being a derivative with respect to time of this uh, of instantaneous velocity this time, which means it's the second derivative of the displacement. Uh, now we've got these equations of kinematics that were a big deal in high school, but are not going to be very important in this course at all. We're going to focus much more on the basic reason behind this. Uh, it breaks my heart to see people thinking that physics is all about figuring out which one of these equations you're going to substitute into. No, no, no. F physics is about knowing why things work, right? You've got to understand why the real world works this way, and then you're doing physics. It's the meaning, right? Physics is what says, let's sub let's figure out from this real system how to model it, then you do math for a while where you're solving this equation maybe, and then you go back to the meaning at the end, that part at the beginning where you're translating into the math and the part at the end where you're translating out of the math, that's the physics. Now, while we're here, where do these equations of kinematics come from? They come from needing a constant acceleration. So let's just go for a little bit and mess around with that. We've got that the uh, acceleration in one dimension, a is equal to x double dot, which is a short form for saying the second derivative of x with respect to time. So if a is equal to the second derivative of x with respect to time, first of all, a is, we could also say the first derivative of velocity with respect to time. Now, let's Imagine a is a constant and try and solve this for velocity. We have dv is equal to a dt. If a is a constant, then we can integrate both sides of this. So maybe integral dv is equal to the integral of a dt. And there's a couple of ways you could do this. You could say this is v equals a times the time plus some constant uh, of integration. We could have added a constant on the left, but then bringing it over here will make it cancel. So that means we have to have that velocity is equal to acceleration times the time plus some, some offset. And this constant will have units of velocity so that we can, um, so that this equation is going to work out. Acceleration times time also has to have units of velocity. And the constant 
what would be meaningful for it? Well, it would be the velocity when we substitute in a time, substitute in a time of zero. This is physics that we're using now to figure this out. So this is going to be then at plus v naught. That's one way to do it. Another way is we could come back to this and then do a definite integral instead. So when you think about this with a definite integral, you have to imagine uh, what the ranges would be so that we're integrating from the same spot on the bottom that this bound corresponds to this bound and on the top this bound corresponds to this bound so let's imagine we go from uh, v0 the initial point when it had initial velocity to the final one which we'll just call v like the instantaneous one at whatever time we're going to calculate it over here the time when we were at v0 let's say was zero and let's say the time when we're at the uh, final velocity or instantaneous velocity v we're interested in is time t then after we do this we're going to get v minus v naught if you want to if that's too many steps you can think about it being we're integrating one with respect to v so we get v and we're going to substitute in the bottom boundary and then the top boundary and that's going to turn into v minus v naught. Okay, same thing over here. We're going to have a times t from t equals zero to t with um, more than one thing inside. You might have forgotten whether a or t was the integral, uh, was the variable of integration. So maybe it's better to just put in at the bottom what the variable was from t equals zero to t. Uh, you could say from t to t equals t up there, but if you've already specified the variable at the bottom, that's going to be clear. Okay, then we're going to have a and then t minus 0. Yeah, so we got v minus v0 is equal to a times t minus 0, or v equals a t plus v naught. Aha, got it. Okay, so that's a kinematic equation derivation for this first one there. Yeah. Now, how do we go from there to some of these other ones? Well, let's just integrate again. So we had, again, that v is a t plus v naught, where a is a constant. Then v being equal to dx by dt lets us do this again. dx is equal to a t plus v naught dt. Integrate on both sides. Uh, Either way, if you want to think of integrating and getting 1 half at squared plus v naught t plus some constant, and then realizing, aha, for left side to equal right side at time 0, this constant has to be x naught. That's one way to do it. Or you could do the manual integration way again and say we're going to integrate from x naught to x. Then we'll have the kind of like minus x naught on the left and from zero to t on the right hand side and we'll get this because when you substitute in a zero you get a zero okay so there's the other kinematic equation um yeah that is this third one here if we don't care about the average velocity one we've got the acceleration to use this in the first place as a constant so probably this one's okay um yeah so there's how you go about deriving kinematic equations. Uh, another one that's useful is this last one here. This equation is nice because it doesn't care about the time that something takes to get there. It just says what after we've fallen a certain distance or gone a certain distance under uniform acceleration will be the final velocity. And this can be pretty convenient for um, let's say falling problems or, or trajectory problems in one dimension where you go up for a certain distance and then down and you want to know if we've got this change in height what is going to be the difference in velocity all right um, so we have to eliminate time in this and let's go back to this earlier equation at plus v naught uh, if we solve this for time we'll have that the time is equal to v minus v naught over a and let's take this thing and substitute it into this expression that we just calculated at the end there. So V minus V naught over A, and then same thing here. Uh, v minus V naught over A. Okay, so we've got v minus v naught all squared
over a squared, and then v minus v naught over a. Uh, let's see, to get it into this form, we kind of need the v and the um, v naught separated out. So we're going to need to expand this thing and let some stuff cancel. So what's this then? Uh, oh, one way to simplify it is this a will cancel with one of these, and then we have an a in this term and this term, and we can bring it over there. Let's first actually, looking at this, we've got the x minus xi over on that side, so we'll subtract the x naught from both sides, basically moving this over. One, one way to think of this, a lot of people think of this operation, x naught, as moving the x naught over to the other side when you do this, but I challenge you to question what really you're doing and why that step in math is allowed. What you're doing is you're saying, hey, this side is equal to this side. And if they're the same thing, then if you do the same thing to each side of them and you and the thing you do doesn't have any randomness in it, they should still be the same thing, right? If x is equal to this thing and you subtract x naught from both sides, what you get on the left should still be equal to what you have on the right. So that's what's really going on. You're subtracting x naught from both sides and then saying that adding and subtracting x naught over here uh, is the same as adding zero, that does nothing. Okay, so now we're gonna multiply both sides of this expression by a to cancel out this a in the denominator. Okay. Oh, keep the brackets there, and we'll have an a over here. And maybe I'd also like to multiply by 2, just to get rid of that fraction. Now we'll have this fraction gone, and we get a 2 in front of this expression, and a 2 over here. Okay, uh, yes, now we're in pretty good shape. So we can expand this binomial and get v squared minus 2 v v naught plus v naught squared, and we'll expand this one too. This will be 2 v v naught minus 2 v naught squared. Okay, so after some canceling here, let's see, we got plus 2 v v naught and minus 2 v v naught, so we'll let that cancel. And this plus v naught minus 2 v naught is just like a minus v naught and there we go the final velocity squared is equal to the initial velocity squared plus 2 a times the displacement huzzah okay next question to lock this in for the watch you drop a five kilogram bowling ball off the great wall of china which is eight meters high at some invading mongolians how fast is it falling when it hits the mongolian whose head is two meters off the ground on horseback and suppose the mongolians also have frost giants and they're four meters tall how fast is the bowling ball when it hits a frost giant okay so with this one we can use the equations that we just derived or the the, the earlier form of this because this is just falling from gravity, and gravity acceleration is a constant, so the kinematic equations are valid. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to use this, and we'd have to go back to the um, to the fundamental stuff up here about acceleration being the derivative of velocity, and velocity being the time derivative of position, and then just kind of redo this. So remember that this whole derivation was based on the acceleration being constant. Otherwise, when we do this integral here, we won't just get a times t. If a is some function of t itself, then the integral of that doesn't just multiply it by time, right? Okay, but in this case, because a is a constant, we do just get that multiplication by time, and eventually that leads to this kinematic equation. But the fundamental thing is that definition of acceleration earlier. Anyway, uh, let's see. We'll use some more maple here. We'll say that the final velocity, the f squared is equal to the i squared plus 2a times delta x or delta delta position. In this case, delta h. Delta H, yeah. Uh, now, the other thing is the balls are dropped, so that means zero, and two, negative 
meters per second squared will be the acceleration from gravity. And we've got, uh, let's imagine, so this is kind of like h final minus h initial. The wall is eight meters high. So we just have this expression here, that uh, this, this thing here that we'd substitute in. And finally have v final is equal to the root of two times eight meters. Well, I guess two times, let's say 9.8 meters per second squared. 8 meters minus the final height. All right, uh, now we could go and calculate this, but let's just do a quick estimate first and say this is about root 20 times um, 8 minus the height. And if the height is 4 meters in the second case, then we've got root 20 times 4, root 80. Uh, let's see, what is square root of 80? So 7 squared, 49, 8 squared, um, 64, 9 squared is 81. So this is basically 9, right? So this is going to be about 9 meters per second. What about in the other case, where we have the square root of... 8 minus 2 meters, and that's going to be root of 20 times 6. Root 20 times 6 is 120. How much faster is it after it's fallen an additional 2 meters? All right, so let's see. Root of 120, this is about 11, right? So about 11 meters per second. And this is kind of surprising at first, right? Like it looks like the height is going to be um, making a big difference, right? This this person is two meters below the frost giant. So here it's fallen four meters. Now it's fallen six meters. It's fallen 50% further, but it's not 50% higher speed by that point. Well, another way to think about this is once it's already going nine meters per second, when it's four meters down, it doesn't take very long at all for it to go another two meters, right? It'll take almost, this is about 10 meters a second, right? So it'll take about 20% of a second to go another two meters. And by that point, it will have accelerated by another 20% of 10 meters per second squared, which is two meters per second. So there we go. This is how we get to an extra 11 meters per second after just, um, after another two meters. Kind of surprising at first, 50% more um, more distance leads to significantly less than 50% more velocity. Okay, let's double check this stuff. Besides that sense check that checked it, uh, let's do this. Uh, let's get the exact numbers, I should say, in, uh, in Maple here. So we could do this a couple of different ways. We could start with the end expression. Take square root of 2 times uh, g. Let's define that. G is 9.81, uh, colon is what I wanted there. G is 9.81 times 8 minus um, 4, whoops, 8 minus 4, about 9. And if we put in a 2, then we get about 11. Okay, so that confirms the rough numbers that we were doing earlier. Uh, how else could we do this? We could start off kind of at the beginning. We could say restart vf squared is equal to vi squared plus 2 times uh, a times dh. And then we could say dh is equal to um, hf minus uh, hi, where hi is 8. We could say that um, a is equal to negative 9.81. Um, vi is equal to zero. And then, now this is, this is rough. We can't actually assign to vf squared. We can assign to vf and say this is our equation. Or rather, we could assign to vf as the square root of this right-hand side, or we can make this an equation. Yeah, let's just call it equation. Okay. 
So now let's recheck what equation is now that we've got those variables. And we could say subs hf equals 2 into equation. Solve that. Two possible answers, 10.9. So this basically 11 thing or this negative one because um, when we have the v final squared is this it's just as consistent with us getting a negative answer right we took the square root and we knew we were looking for the um the positive root here but is there any physical significance to the fact that a negative final velocity would also have worked here so here, let's see. Well, actually, maybe the negative is the one that we wanted. Because if we're defining positive, if we're defining the, 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 the initial height as positive 8, um, then final height being positive 2 means we must be going at a negative velocity at that point. So the positive and negative root tell you that we could be going... It doesn't know whether we're talking about earlier in time or later in time from this situation. So this is actually telling you two different things. It tells you that if it at one point was at a height of eight and at another at velocity zero and at another point is at height four, the velocity when it's at height four could be positive nine meters per second going up if it's at the start of this parabolic trajectory in time or could be negative nine meters per second if the four height is later than when it was at eight height. One other thing in the notes here is this indication of complex numbers. I'll make a note that in Maple, if you had done this a little bit differently, um, let's imagine you didn't reverse this or you put in G as negative 9.81, you'll have this answer with the I at the end. What that's telling you is the square root of negative one is that there's an imaginary number in there, right? Square root negative one is capital I in Maple for whatever reason. Um, small i is usually used in math to represent um, the 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 unit distance along the imaginary axis. Square root of negative one um, in electrical engineering and programming. I is already heavily used for current and for um, a counter variable, respectively. So a lot of those systems, electrical engineering systems like circuits we're going to deal with in, um, in next semester, or the, um, or the programming that you've encountered in first year and we'll, we'll do a lot more of in computational multiphysics, uses J as the com as the imaginary number so you might find j being used as root negative one maple for some reason splits the difference and uses capital i rather than interrupting i or j so it use if you see this in maple it means square root negative one okay up next vectors uh, recall that scalars are things like five degrees or seven or 58 meters but vectors have um, multiple components and obey the laws of vector addition instead. So you could represent a vector by like magnitude and direction, direction in whatever dimension the, the vector is in. That's sort of the graphical interpretation of them. The, if you've got A and B and you want to add them together, you can put them tip of A to tail of B, and that's going to be the resultant. This is as if you'd gone A in your displacement, and then from this as your new starting point, you apply B. It's another way to think about it. You could have them as sides of a parallelogram too if you want to visualize it this way all right components are usually the way that you want to add these in um, in a mathematical sense rather than this graphical interpretation but fall back on what the graphical interpretation is to help remember how this works the x component of a you usually give it with an a sub x like this whereas the bold a not italic is the whole vector so this is the x component of this vector a this is the same as the projection of A along the x-axis of whatever coordinate system we're using, which you could get by A cos theta if theta is the angle that this vector makes with the x-axis. The y component is the projection along the y-axis, which would be A sine theta. Um, theta being 
Why do we use cos for this one, sine for this one? Well, if we had, instead of theta this angle, we'd use like this angle here, alpha or something, then the y component would be a cos alpha. But because theta is the angle between the vector and the x-axis, it ends up being sine for that. Uh, let's just check this with Sokotoa. So you might remember that um, for this thing, cos theta is equal to adjacent over the hypotenuse, and the adjacent is ax in length over a in length. Notice I'm not using the bold symbol because this is just the magnitude of that whole length. So then ax would be a cos theta. Similarly, sine theta is the opposite over hypotenuse. So from like so ka toa, yeah. Um, and that would be this thing on the right here, which is the same length as ay. So then ay would be equal to a sine theta. You can express a vector as the sum of its components multiplied by unit vectors, axi and ayj, where i is the unit vector in the x direction and j is the unit vector in the y direction. So this is the same as the original vector. Um, this is implied by using bracket notation. So triangle bracket notation, a vector could be one, two, three, and triangle brackets like this all in line, or the, the best one, column vector notation, where you write it like this. Column vector is really great for, um, for adding things up. It's a lot more convenient. So you see we've got a, um, an addition here. Rather than putting them in four angle 30 degrees away from the x-axis is, is, is what that means, and three angle 60 degrees away from the x-axis, first convert them into their column vector notation, and then you can just add them directly. So to see the first component is just going to be four times this thing plus three times this thing will tell you the, the result there. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Bit of a break. This is this. It's time. It's time for you to get good at trig. Uh, I've, I've been teaching math for a long time throughout these things. Uh, I, I taught uh, T8 math back as an undergrad and um, and taught this course at the time, Calculus 1 MO3, Math for Business, Humanities, and Social Sciences, whereas the engineers and, and science students took the um, took a, a different version of this each, and their version had two calculus courses, whereas the Business, Humanities, and Social Sciences just had one. And the, even though there was only one course for Business, Humanities, and Social Sciences, they covered almost twice the number of topics as were in the first course for the engineering people or the science people. The reason is that they were able to go so much further in an easier course because they didn't have any trig. So most of what's making math difficult for you, I would propose to you, is actually trig. And if you were somehow, if you could like just snap your fingers and be so good at trig that it didn't matter whether it was that or something as simple as like an exponential function, then a lot of the difficulty that you're having in math will, will go away. So let's commit. Time to get good at trig. Uh, all right. Well, to get good at trig, you want to really understand it, and you can do this by knowing these six things and then deriving all of the rest of them. Derive doesn't mean differentiate, by the way. It means come up with a formula for it. So be able to prove the rest of the things from these. Okay, fundamental trig identity. Fundamental, remember, in math doesn't mean easy. It means important. Sine squared plus cos squared is one. That's the fundamental trig identity. Um, parity of sine and cosine. The fact that sine is odd, so sine of negative x is negative sine x, while cos is even. The sum angle formulas for sine and cosine. So this you can remember with like a, a song maybe. Sine of x plus y is sine x cos y plus cos x sine y. Um, whereas cosine is uh, is not an equal opportunities thing like sine is. It says, okay, put the cos children over here and put the sine children over there and put a negative in front of them because they're evil sine children. Um, so put the cosines together and the sines over there. Anyway, that's how cosine works. Sine uh, is this more symmetric one in this situation. Yeah. So, so Katoa, the next thing, and the unit circle, how to use these things. Then the inverse functions that cosecant 
secant and cotangent are one over the equivalent things up here. So remember, if it doesn't have a co in its name, then its inverse function does and vice versa. So the inverse of secant is cosine, whereas the inverse of cosecant is sine. Either the function or the inverse function needs a co. And finally, derivatives of sine and cosine. So derivative of sine is cos, derivative of cos is negative sine. And then from this, you can prove all the other stuff that you need to know commonly in trig. Example, let's um, get the fundamental trig identity for tangent and secant. This is something you use in, um, in the trig integral section in first year math. So to do this, you start off with sine squared plus cos squared is one fundamental trig identity, then divide everything by cos squared. That's going to create a tangent over here and a one there and a sec squared there. So this is just the same thing as this identity. You don't need to memorize this one. Just remember this and vaguely understand the process of how to go from this derivation to this one. Another example, sine of 2x is sine of, well, isn't that x plus x? And that's just the sine formula, sine x cos of the second thing plus cos of the first thing, sine of the second thing. So in this case, it's sine x cos x plus cos x sine x. That's the same thing, so that's two sine x cos x. Another thing you don't have to memorize if you've memorized the sine sum angle formula. What about the cos sum angle formula? Same idea applying this one and recognizing that 2x is just x plus x. So that's, um, that's going to be cos cos minus sine sine or cos squared minus sine squared. And now we can use the fundamental trig identity to mess around with this a bit, get maybe like sine squared is one minus cos squared or two cos squared minus one after we simplify this. And then you can solve this for cos squared and get that cos squared is cos two x plus one over two. If you instead had substituted in cos squared is one minus sine squared, you would eventually go and end up with sine squared is one minus cos two x over two. Try and prove that using the same thing that we did to prove this. All right, uh, what about the integral of cos squared? This is where you would use these things, right? You might remember to integrate cos squared, you first use these so-called half angle formulas to get it into cos of two x plus one over two, and that you can integrate more easily using a, a, a quick substitution. Okay, what about the difference angle formula, sine x minus y? Well, this is like the sum angle formula and the parity relations. So recognize that as x plus negative y, and then cos of negative y is cos y, while sine of negative y is negative sine y. So there we go. That's why the difference one ends up with that, et cetera, et cetera. This is, this is it's time. It's time to get good at trig, and this is going to get you there. All right, I put this into the into the notes in a newer version so if this doesn't appear before motion in two dimensions in your version then there's a newer version of the notes for you to find um, on the teams page right now or maybe on avenue in some distant future if we're using that again all right so motion in two dimensions kinematic equations if a particle moves with constant acceleration and has velocity vi at position at and position ri at this initial time we can get the same kind of um, kinematic equations as before, but now with vectors. So the same things work except with vectors as before. Uh, well, why? We could go ahead and rederive these just like we did above, but using the definitions of acceleration as derivative of velocity and velocity as derivative of position and come up with the same process, but now dealing with them as vectors. Nothing about them being vectors stops the same derivation from working as before. Projectile motion is one example of this two-dimensional vector motion under constant acceleration, where unless there's, um, this, is, this, is, this shows up when you're ignoring wind friction, and computational multiphysics will add that in. Uh, but for now, imagine there's no wind friction, and now we've got an x acceleration of zero and a y acceleration of negative g. It's useful to think about this as a superposition of a constant velocity motion in x and a free fall motion in the vertical direction. Another example of, of constant seeming acceleration that's actually kind of uh, breaking the scheme in this vector thing is uniform circular motion. 
So this undergoes a constant centripetal acceleration due to changing direction. If you think about it in two dimensions, there's, there's two kinds of acceleration you could imagine. One is a direction changing acceleration and the other is a speed changing acceleration. So the direction changing acceleration is perpendicular to the direction of motion uh, and the speed changing acceleration is parallel to the direction of motion, tangential to the direction of motion. Uh, so uniform circular motion says we've got a centripetal, in order to move in a circle or even if it's not uniform circular motion, it turns out this is true instantaneously for the, um, the, the direction change, the current circular path that it's going on. Like if you think about something, let's do a, a spline curve to maybe talk about this a bit. If we, this is paint.net, I'm going to just take some um, thing here, hit some uh, dots to get rid of that, hit this forward slash to toggle the arrow. If you want to know what the hotkeys are in paint.net, just hover over any of these things. And, um, and the tool, let's say for the line, is O. But this sort of toggles between line and box. They have the same shortcut key. So anyway, um, yeah. So here's our line. And here's maybe a path that a thing could be going on. Let's put a, a thing back in, an arrowhead back in. So let's imagine this is the path that something takes. Uh, at any moment on this path, let's imagine, uh, let's say, this spot right there, or this spot right there, or this spot right there. Instantaneously, it's moving along a circular path, right? So you could find some circle, which is perfectly tangent to the, the, the thing and lines up with it based on the curvature that it's doing. So to fit something into here at this edge, we need a very small circle, whereas over in this more flat section here, you'd need a pretty big circle. I guess we want to go this way, yeah. You need a pretty big circle for it to be lining up very well with the, the radius that things are taking. Okay, so something that looks like it's pretty close to this one here at that arc. So right around this spot, we have this kind of a radius. At that little spot, you've got a smaller radius. Um, and at any point where it's changing direction, you could still say that locally, the centripetal acceleration is its speed squared divided by the radius through which the circle, uh, the radius of the circle that it's bending in. So the smaller the radius, the larger the centripetal acceleration or direction changing acceleration needs to be. All right, so again, radial component is the one that changes the direction. Tangential component is the one that changes the speed. All right, a highway off-ramp takes cars through a 90 degree direction change. So you've got some arc that goes through a 90 degree direction change eventually. It has multiple lanes. So there's like an inner lane where it's a shorter distance and there's an outer lane where it's a longer distance. Which lane is the fastest to take if it's a sunny day and you're limited by the speed limit? And which lane is the fastest to take if it's a rainy day and you're limited by friction connecting your tires to the road? So this is, this is maybe... Um, something that might not be so obvious. The first one, if there's a limit to how fast you can go, you want to go with the shortest path, right? Fast, you can, and the, the limit is the same no matter what lane you're in, then the shortest path is going to be the, the fastest you could go around this arc. So it's definitely the inner one. But the, the second one's a little more complicated, right? You're limited by the friction connecting your tires to the road. Uh, so let's work this out. In the... The, the distance that you have to go around this arc is equal to the angle through which you go, pi by two, um, times the radius. So the this is the distance you get to you have to go. The time taken would be the distance divided by the velocity. Right? Let's just check the units. So or the speed rather. This is in, let's say, meters, 
and this would be meters per second, so the seconds is going to flip up to the top. Yeah, so we did that, right? Uh, the time taken will be the distance divided by the speed. Now, what speed could you be going? The problem is when you're closer in, you need to do a tighter turn, so you can't, um, you would need more acceleration to be able to do that same turn, right? The, the acceleration that you could have is limited on um, in in this situation where you've got uh, or is the limiting factor rather so how much acceleration is needed well the a r magnitude has to be v squared over r and it's supplied by the coefficient of friction times the normal force right this is the force of friction so it's not an acceleration units how do we turn the, the force into acceleration? Well, we're going to use Newton's second law. And force equals mass times acceleration. So acceleration is going to be equal to the force divided by the mass. And this thing, nothing in this is, um, is changing based on what lane you're in or what speed you're going. So with all of this in mind, we've got a fixed maximum acceleration that the road, tire, system, and car system can provide uh, for driving on this road, independent of what speed you're going or what lane you're in. There's a certain maximum amount there. So imagine that you somehow know this, right? This is, uh, this is not something you you would have on your display of what fraction of the maximum possible acceleration uh, you your car could go at, you're going at. That would be really useful to know. Uh, it's it's changing perhaps very quickly. So you would know, let's imagine you're taking a turn and you could know, hey, warning, you're at like 90% of your max acceleration. If you speed up or take this turn sharper or the road gets slightly worse, then you're gonna skid off the road. That would be a good indication. But we don't know that um, when we're driving. So we have to be careful not to, not to hit this thing. Anyway, this is the, suppose that this is the limiting factor rather than maximum speed being the limiting factor. What lane do we use? That's the second, that's what we're asking in the second thing here. So, this means we've got a fixed AR and we want to kind of rewrite the time in terms of that. So uh, delta T is going to be equal to the distance, which is pi over 2R, pi over 2R, divided by the velocity, which is the root of AR times R. So, since AR might be, is constant no matter what lane you're in, as we figured out, we could simplify this pi over 2 uh, root R over AR. So what does this mean? This means the time taken is proportional to the square root of the radius divided by this fixed acceleration. So a couple of different situations. If, let's substitute in pi over two r over v here. If the velocity is fixed, no matter what lane you're in, everybody's driving the speed limit, you're going around this, this turn, then uh, you wanna be at the smallest radius because that's gonna make a big difference on the time that it takes you to go around this, this turn. If on the other hand, the acceleration is fixed and you have to go slower if you're in the innermost lane then at least for getting around that turn you still want to go in the smallest radius because it's going to make a shorter path though not as much of a shorter path as it was before another reason why you still might want to be in more of an outer lane in this uh in this situation is that after the turn is done if you were going faster, you won't have to accelerate back up to the safe velocity for the straightaway uh, like you would if you were on the in an inner lane where you had to reduce your speed around that arc. 
Okay, up next is the Essential Maple Syntax Preview. Uh, this is located in another file and there's a whole video on that. If you were watching via the playlist, you probably saw that video already. But if you've started with this video or with the file and come across this thing, this is really just here to tell you, hey, go check out that other thing. This is going to give you all of the background information on how to use Maple very effectively, which we're gonna start to need more and more as we go on with, uh, with these notes. Newton's laws of motion. The first law says no net force means no acceleration. The second law says that if there is a net force, it's equal to the mass of the object times the acceleration that it experiences. So the net force on an object is its mass times its acceleration. For this to be true, given that force and acceleration are vectors, you need every component to be equal as well. So that means net force in x has to equal mass times acceleration in x, net force in y has to equal mass times acceleration in y, etc. Um, yeah, statics is the field where the acceleration is zero, so that means that the force acting on something is zero as well. Newton's third law says that for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. Really it means that the force of object one on object two is equal and opposite to the force of object two on object one. The force of A on B is negative the force of B on A. One application of Newton's third law is birds being able to fly or really anything being able to fly. They put a force downward on the air which allows the reaction force of the air upward on the bird to overcome gravity allowing them to fly. You use Newton's third law anytime you walk somewhere. The the force of you pushing the earth backwards with your with the friction of your feet on the ground is equal and opposite to the force that the ground puts on you, allowing you to move forward. So with this we can use Fg, gravity, is m times g, where g is gravitational acceleration, 9.8 meters per second squared towards the earth. Uh, friction is in two different kinds, this is a, the, the model we're going to use, that you used a lot for friction in first year anyway. Um, static friction is up to a maximum value of the coefficient of static friction, mu s, times the normal force. This is the maximum value of, of uh, static friction. Kinetic friction is if an object is sliding along a surface already, then the force opposing that sliding is mu k times the normal force equal to the maximum value of, of static friction as long as these coefficients are the same, but usually the static friction coefficient is a lot larger. So you have to put force on something up until you get the, the you overcome the maximum static friction possible, and then the coefficient of friction drops down to the kinetic one, and the object will slide more easily. So this is why something won't move, and then suddenly it, it breaks free and starts sliding. Uh, does friction prevent motion? Well, not quite. It prevents relative motion between surfaces. It's ultimately the force again that causes your car or you to move forward. Okay, which of these two uh, situations will give you more force between the blocks? Or is it the same? Well, one way to think about it, if they're on a frictionless surface, that is, and, and therefore moving at constant acceleration, is that the acceleration of this block is the same as this block, and the acceleration of the combination is the same in each situation. So if this block then has the same magnitude of acceleration as this one, because this is twice the mass, it has to have twice the force, right? So uh, in this situation, we've got twice the contact force between them as we do in this situation. Contact force between them is the normal force. By the way, normal force is uh, using normal in the sense of perpendicular. Friction is like the parallel force, right? So the normal force is the perpendicular force between objects. Both of them are ultimately caused by electrostatic repulsion of the electron clouds in one object pushing off of the electron cloud in another object to stop them from being able to move through each other. All right, let's make it a little bit more complicated by putting a rope in between. Uh, now, if this is still a frictionless surface and the rope is massless, then we want to figure out what the tension is in the rope. So we could do that by, let's use control L to put that over there so we can still see this when we're working. Um, we could do this by saying that the total mass, 
times the acceleration is equal to the net force, Fp. With no friction, there's no other external force on this other than Fp. So uh, the total mass, though, is 3m. So now we can solve for what the acceleration is. A is equal to Fp over 3m. And this has to also be, this, this acceleration is the acceleration of each of the blocks. So this acceleration must be the acceleration of the left block, where the net force on it is t, and its mass is m. And it's also the acceleration of the right block, where the net force on it is the force to the right, Fp, minus the force to the left, which is the tension, divided by its mass, 2m. So now this equation is useful for us to solve for what the tension is. Um, yeah, so let's see. We'll multiply both sides by 2m, and we'll get 2t equals uh, fp minus t, or t is equal to fp over 3. Huzzah! Next up, let's suppose that there's some tension. Uh, we want to find the tension in the rope if the rope has a mass per unit length of mu and a total length of L. Okay, so mu is not the coefficient of friction here, it's the mass per unit length. So then, what would the tension be? Well, the tension is going to be different at different parts, right? We could again figure out what the acceleration is by saying that the total mass, which now will be 3m plus mu times L, is the rope mass. If mu was the mass per unit length, multiply by its length to get its total mass. That's the total mass times the acceleration has to again be equal to Fp. So now we can say acceleration equals Fp over this total mass. And this is going to be equal to the acceleration of the left block, which is going to be the net force on it, tension at the left end, over its mass. And now that's supposed to equal the tension, uh, the, the force, the acceleration of the right block, right, which is the Fp minus the tension at the right end over its mass, 2m. Okay, so proceeding as before, we could uh, simplify this thing out, but the problem is now we can't solve for tension from just this equation because we have two unknowns. So we're going to need to combine some things. So let's go with uh, solving this equation and then maybe this equals this as the, the right hand side as the second equation. That is, let's solve this for t left. t left will then be equal to fp times m over 3m plus mu l. And we'll solve <clears throat> that this is equal to this side, the right side here, for the tension at the right. Let's do that. And we'll get t right is equal to, uh, let's see, 2m fp over 3m plus mu l minus, uh, oh wait, hold on. We'll do this up and then this thing move over to the other side. So that'll be over here. So we'll have fp minus that. What I did is I brought, I multiplied both sides by this to bring it up over there. And then I took Fp on the right side, moved this, moved the T right over to the left by adding it to both sides and subtracted the thing that we had here from both sides to bring it over there. Right, kind of a lot of steps. Um, double check that, it might've made a mistake. So anyway, what do we have next? We want to combine this into a common thing. So let's imagine that we take a common denominator between this of 3m plus mu l and multiplying this by the numerator and then subtracting this we're going to have 1m left and then we can imagine taking the fp back out of that
to have this thing. Okay, so we've got a couple of expressions for what the tension will be on the rope at each end of this if it has a mass of mu L. So let's just double check here what we found. Which tension is higher? The tension at the left hand side is FP M over 3M plus mu L. And the tension at the right hand side is that same thing plus this other term up here, FP times mu L over that same denominator. So the tension at the right hand side is bigger. Does that make sense? Yes, because the right hand side has to accelerate, has to be enough force to accelerate a larger mass, the mass of this block plus the mass of the rope. Another thing, if the, I mean, nothing about this derivation should be different if it happens that mu L is so small that it's basically zero, right? So that means we should be able to have this reduced to the same thing we found earlier if mu L gets very small. Let's check. If mu L is very small, this becomes FP. This is negligible compared to this. So the M's cancel and we've got just FP over three. Yeah. What about this one? Again, you drop out those, then the M's cancel, FP over three. All right. Looks good. Yeah. Another way to check besides this sort of sense check thing there is with maple. Okay, we'll check this in maple using a solve command. And the solve command is going to set up the same equations that we did. So let's say the left hand side, we've got mass times acceleration is equal to the net force on that, which would be T left. And then we've got the acceleration on this uh, Newton's second law on this right block, which would be FP minus the, or let's put mass times acceleration on the left like we did up here. So its mass would be two times M times A equals FP minus T right. And then we've got the total object, which has a total mass of three times M plus mu times L times that same acceleration is equal to FP. Okay, problem is we don't know what to solve for here. There's all kinds of different variables there. Which one are which ones are we looking for? We are looking for the left tension, the right tension, and the acceleration. Everything else was a variable that was given in the problem and is what our solution is written in. So by giving Maple a list for the solve command of what to look for, it'll tell us which variables to actually get an equation for. Here we go. So T left is MFP over 3M plus mu L like we had. T right, same expression. And acceleration, also this same expression we had at the, at the beginning here. Great, we did it. So the write-up in the notes is another way to check. This did a, uh, a different strategy of going through this than the one that we talked about in the video exactly, but they come up with the same result. Uh, now, another thing is since the mass per unit length is constant, you can reason that the tension has to change linearly from left to right because we're going to need linearly more force from left to right as the mass is increasing linearly and the force needed is proportional to the mass if the acceleration is a constant. So then the tension, this is a, a convenient way to write a linear function like this. You say that the tension at every position is going to be the value when x is zero plus something which is going to turn it from the left tension to the right tension when you put in x equals l and go linearly between. So this does all the right things. And by the uniqueness of this function, the uniqueness of the, the form, this is going to be like there's only one possible linear function that can have the value of t left when we put in x is zero and t right when we put in x equals l and 
uh, and be a line. There's only one line that can connect those two points if you think about it graphically. So this is the only function that you could use for this. We don't. We didn't find a function that does this. We found the function. If you say that it's the same function, if you were to rearrange it, like simplify it out, multiply through that sort of thing. Okay. So this is kind of a neat trick to think through how to get a linear function and um, model this this uh, tension with position. Okay. You could substitute in the tensions we found and come up with an expression for what the tension is as a function of position. Now, if the force gradually increases, we start pulling harder and harder until the rope breaks. Where is it going to break first? If this thing is still accelerating the whole time? Well, where the force is the biggest at the right hand. All right, let's do another version with a little bit of trig. If the force is just enough to cause this block to move, then what is the coefficient of friction is the first part. Okay, so what we're going to do is first of all draw a free body diagram for this. Let's get a new thing. Actually, let's expand the canvas out. Sure, the phenomenally futuristic resolution 800 by 600. So we'll hit O to get our vector again and we'll say what? We've got some friction backwards, maybe force of friction, FF, and then we've got a normal force, and we've got some weight, force of gravity, which is this 100 Newton. Uh, we'll turn off italic, 100 Newton. Yeah, because these variables should be in italic, but this should not be, if we're being really picky here. Good to be picky. Let's be technically correct, the best kind of correct. All right, so what is the coefficient of friction if this is just stopping this motion? Uh, let's see. Well, we've got a force balance in two directions. Maybe we'll do this as a, um, as a vector here, and maybe we'll use maple from the start just to be something different from the notes down there. All right, so let's think. Um, we have a couple of different equations. We've got the, uh, let's see, normal, the, the force in the y direction has to equal the acceleration in the y direction, which is zero. And the force in the x direction has to equal the acceleration in the x direction. So um, if it's just enough to cause the block to move, then the acceleration in x is also zero. So what we have like it's just barely above zero, right? So that means that we have um, how about solve the force balance in x is going to be 50 times cos of Let's make a, an angle here. Q is equal to 30 times pi over 180. And Maple, capital P, small i, is 3.14159. Oh, let me put this in another execution group. Control K to go to a different one. Um, to show you, show you what I mean here. As opposed to this, this, or this. Yeah, these are variables that you could use. Capital P small i is 3.14159. Yeah. So down here, we'll say q is 30 pi over 180. To convert it to radians, we need everything to be in radians for the trig here. So 50 newtons. In fact, let's not have a magic number here either. Let's say that f is equal to 50, and then we'll say f cos q minus ff is the net force in the x direction. We don't have to say equals zero, remember, because that's implied by the solve command. And we've got in the y direction, n minus 100 down. Uh, in fact, let's put that as w. No magic numbers at all. And we're going to also have upward in the y direction, the thing everybody forgets when they do a question like this, this y component of this force because we're not applying it horizontally part of this is lifting it up and reducing how strong the normal force has to be which has a positive effect because it reduces what 
the friction force is. So n mi minus w plus f times the sine of q. All right, and as expected, we had everything known there except for the normal force and the friction force. So this is what the friction force has to be. Another thing we could have done is substituted in at the start that the friction force is equal to Fs max. And what's Fs max? Fs max, max static friction, is mu s times the normal force. Now, we've this uh, will be substituted in all the way along so that now this expression that we're solving is one in terms of just the coefficient of static friction and the normal force. We could put that in a separate expression to look at it before we solve it. So here's the equations we've got. That 0 has to equal 25 root 3 minus mu sn and n minus 75. Another thing we could do is get rid of those constants that we're assigning. And now we can't really solve for it anymore because stuff isn't known. We don't have enough information. What if we know the angle? Can we solve for it? Yes. Uh, but we don't know what we're solving for. So let's say solve this for mu s and normal force. Okay. So, depending on what the magnitude of the force that we're applying is, and what the weight is, we can have a different value of the coefficient of static friction if this force is just enough to make it move. Another thing that we could do is keep this the same, but kind of mess around with what's going on with the angle. So if we know those other things, if we know f and we know w, then depending on what the angle is, we'd have a different coefficient of static friction if we're just overcoming it. So what's your intuition here? If we were to take this same situation and put the force horizontally versus 30 degrees, and for a different situation, that's now just enough to cause it to move again, would that be for a larger or a smaller static friction coefficient? Well, let's see. We can change around Q here manually, put in different values like zero. We have a half. If we put in 30 degrees, it's root three over three. Let's turn these into floating points. 0.57, it's larger. If we put in 40 degrees, we get something smaller now. Interesting. So if you put in 20 degrees, it's about the same size. 30 degrees, larger. 40 degrees, smaller. Uh, we could leave that as a variable and then say, assign this set of expressions so that now mu s is something we can plot and then look at it. So it seems that we have a maximum coefficient of static friction at some intermediary angle around 0.57 radians or so. Okay, so we could find out exactly where that is by using maximize. Maximize this thing, mu s, we can give it a range, q equals zero to pi by two, and then let's give it another argument which you might not have to do in earlier in uh, newer versions of Maple. Anyway, maximize mu s q equals zero to pi by two, specify the location where it found it, and it tells us that the maximum 
coefficient of friction is actually the one we had already at 30 degrees pi by six um, and that's that's what this is this is the point five seven or so radians and that is the highest value of the coefficient of friction that we could get which tells you that if you're pulling this block along a surface in this sort of a situation you shouldn't actually just pull straight across you should pull at a 30 degree angle because that gives you the maximum um, way to overcome the the most friction possible um, to get it to start moving So further down in the notes here, we solve some other questions that might be fun for you to work through. What will the block's acceleration be? How would you do that? Well, once it's going, you replace the friction force with the kinetic friction, and then substitute that into your equations and come up with the acceleration at that point once it's actually moving. Uh, okay. What's the requirement for applied force and angle for overcoming static friction? This does something similar to what we were doing in Maple there, except writing it all out. You need that the horizontal force is greater than the static friction, and then substituting in what the vertical force will be to figure out the normal force. You can come up with a combined condition here that uh, tells you what you need to have in order to overcome static friction. In Maple, we fixed F and just looked at what the optimum theta was. But it turns out that that's going to depend on uh, basically by, so what the optimum angle was for a given static friction, that is. That's what we looked at. Um, or really, what was the maximum static friction you could deal with at all angles, and where does that occur? And we found out that for this particular F of 50, where W is 100, the maximum static friction you could deal with is this at an angle of pi by 6. But that's going to depend on what F and W are, as you can see from this expression. And we can try that out in, in Maple to explore that. What if F is 100? Then there's no answer, right? What's going on there? Well, this means that we... Um, well, now we're applying enough force that we could actually lift up the block, right? So the force is now as high as the weight. And that means the, the question of what's the max static friction you could overcome, any static friction, if you can put your force straight up, you can just break this whole system down, right? All right, let's look in the other extreme. What if we have a really low force? Then what angle do we, do we work at? Arctan of 11 over 33. Um, yeah, so the angle gets closer and closer to zero if you have lower forces. But the friction that you can deal with is lower as well. What if we have a force of just one? Yeah. So the best bet for low force is to just pull directly in the direction of motion, but the chance of overcoming friction is not very high because this has gone down quite a lot. This is a pretty low coefficient of static friction there. Um, let's try evaluating that thing as a floating point. Yeah, 0 0.01 is the best we could do there. All right, so the notes here go over this analytical derivation and then said, what's it asks this broad question, what angle gives you the best chance of overcoming static friction? As we've seen, that depends on how, how, uh, how strongly you're pulling and perhaps what the coefficient of static friction is, one or the other at least. If mu s is very small, then you want to apply, apply the force horizontally. That's also true if the coefficient of if the if the force is very small that you have available as well. But as mu s becomes large, more and more vertical forces are better. So this is what we determined analytically here, but also something you can see by exploring around with this plot and changing this to 50 or 60 we go up higher more vertical force higher angle than the one we had before than the 0.57 um, 90 where we can almost lift it up shows that you could deal with a higher coefficient of friction if you apply at an angle uh, even higher than before so this is a graphical way to interpret and understand what's going on with the help of this computer tool, what we 
analytically calculated and try and bring it all together. For an optional challenge, you can try to work through the explanation of this in the notes, which involves doing trig of arc trig and this optimization stuff that we that we um, we did by plotting it in Maple or using maximize. You could also have done that by taking derivatives and uh, and, and apply some calculus to come up with the same results. So there's an explanation here if you'd like to give that a shot. Uh, but for now, we're going to go on to circular motion. All right, so next up, centripetal acceleration. Uh, we've seen that radial acceleration, just to move in a circle, is needs you to have an acceleration towards the center of that circle, which is v squared over r. Uh, so let's imagine that we have u on the surface of the Earth. This is you and you're on the surface of the Earth. Now, because you're rotating around the Earth, because the Earth is rotating, you're spinning around the Earth, you don't need as much normal force if the Earth is moving faster. You don't need as much normal force as you otherwise would, right? So here is your weight. Here is a normal force, and these will not add up to the same amount if you are spinning around the Earth, right? So we have to have that there is a enough. There's enough of a difference here to cause you to be able to have this acceleration. So the weight has to be larger than the normal force by this mar, right? So based on this, you could say that the radial force, mass times the radial acceleration, or centripetal acceleration, which is mv squared over r, is going to be equal to your weight, mg, minus the normal force. So this tells us a couple of things. It tells us that the normal force will not to me will not need to be as large if you're moving faster, right? So the faster you move around the earth, the lower the normal force is going to be. If you're standing on a scale, the normal force is what the scale is actually going to measure. So to, in that sense, your effective weight is going to be reduced if you're moving faster. And where are you moving faster from this centripetal acceleration? Well, you're moving faster at a farther out radius for a couple of reasons. Um, well, the yeah, there's a couple of ways to, to think about this. At the pole, at the poles of the Earth, let's imagine that this is kind of the Earth here. And if you imagine one person could be here, another person is there, where and the Earth is spinning around like that. So this person has no extra velocity because the Earth because of the Earth's rotation, whereas this person would have at a radius r of the Earth and a rotational period of one rotation per day, uh, a lot of velocity, and a decent radius that that velocity is at. So the radius is larger for the person there, but the velocity is proportional to the radius. So we could go and rewrite this as r omega squared. Since the omega is the same for each of these people, this tells you that the farther out you are from the axis of rotation, the larger the v squared over r, the larger the centripetal acceleration needs to be. And so the smaller the normal force of the scale that they're standing on is going to be. Okay. So if you stand at the, equa at the equator then, you should, according to a scale, weigh a little bit less than somebody at one of the poles. 
assuming the Earth is a perfect sphere anyway. Uh, let's see how that actually works out. What, let's put in the numbers. So number of seconds per day and the radius of the Earth gives us a radial acceleration of 0 0.0337 meters per second squared, which is a lot smaller than G. So that tells you there's not much of an effect uh, of this. So unfortunately, it's not going to seem like you weigh that much less at the equator compared to the poles. All right, well, what about this? What about the sun? Like you were also rotating around the sun, right? So our rotation around the sun is in such a way that at night we are uh, rotating the, the, the rotation from the Earth spinning and our orbit around the Sun makes us move in complementary directions. So the rotations add at that point. And we can figure out how much of an extra relative change we'd have from the Sun orbiting and then add that to the previous relative change. But it's not much of a relative, relative change there. It's actually even less. So if we take the Sun distance of about eight, um, eight light minutes away, and we combine that with the time, this should be one year times 365 days per year, uh, then multiply by seconds per day, so how much time it takes to go around the sun, and the, the distance using 2 pi r uh, gives us the, the, the total distance we travel, but actually we want the radius times 2 pi over the period there, and that's how we get that it's even less of an effect when you're going around the sun. Okay, but the the logic in this part was faulty. The reason is there's no normal force for our orbit around the sun because we're orbiting. Um, now, another aspect of this is why is it that you that uh, this losing weight thing by having a lower reading on the scale makes you feel more weightless when you're orbiting. And this has to do with general relativity. General relativity says that what gravity is, what this W force here is, is the collapsing of space-time around massive objects so that space and time itself is constantly collapsing into the center of it. And you need to be accelerated away using this normal force in order to, to not collapse with it. So that's why you, you don't actually feel this weight, right? Like this would still, this is still there at the, at the equator and here, even though you're supposedly more weightless because of the rotation and totally weightless if you were moving fast enough. Um, because this, you know, weightless, the feeling of weight that you experience is actually the normal force, not the gravity acceleration, because the gravity acceleration is in a way fictitious. See general relativity for more information about that. So another thing you might want to work out is how fast you have to be going before you don't need any normal force at uh, at the, the surface of the Earth, if you ignore wind friction, which is going to turn out to be a terrible approximation at this speed, uh, you do that by saying that the radial acceleration is just equal to gravity. So the gravity acceleration that's happening is just enough to cause you to move in a circular arc without changing your, your speed at all. So you're just going to orbit. Um, and once you substitute in the radius of the Earth and G, you find out that it's about uh, 7.9 kilometers per second. This is slightly faster than the ISS goes. Uh, why would it be faster than the ISS goes if the ISS gets to ignore wind friction? Um, the ISS is at a larger radius, right? So with a larger radius, you'd think we'd need a higher V. But the other thing that changes as you go further away is gravity, right? And um, the uh, gravity force that we have at the surface of the Earth, that acceleration, is actually just substituting, comes from substituting in the radius that we're at already, and outside of uh, of the Earth, like if you go deeper, it doesn't scale like this. It's like a Coulomb force you might remember from first year. It drops off like 1 over r squared as you move away from the surface of the Earth. So this thing dropping off like 1 over r squared overpowers this thing dropping off like 1 over r, meaning that we have a lower velocity at the altitude that the ISS is at. So up next, work and kinetic energy. Uh, work for a constant force is the product of force 
and the displacement. If the force is a constant, then you take the force, dot it with the displacement, and you get the work done by that force on the object over that displacement. Work is measured in joules, which are newtons times meters. Uh, but in physics, you always want to use joules for this rather than newton meters, because a newton meter is what you use to talk about torque. And uh, torque, even though it has the same units, is a, is a really different physical quantity than work. OK, uh, so here we use dot product which is also known as scalar product because it's a way to multiply or product two vectors that gives you a scalar. So it's the magnitude of one times the magnitude of the other times the cos of the angle between them. If you have a varying force, then you have to integrate along um, the, the entire path if the force isn't the same. Technically, you could have a, um, a path that isn't one dimensional either. And you'll see this in the vector calculus course in 2ZZ work is the integral along that path that the object took force dotted with the displacement along that path technically you do this as a line integral um, which means you have to break up the path into a bunch of little steps and then dot it at each point with where the force points at that instant so you could think about this as a projection projection of the force onto its displacement vector at every um, at every moment, but then you also multiply by the distance that it's gone, so it preserves the length of, um, of the path itself. Kinetic energy is half of mass times velocity, at least as long as velocity is small compared to the speed of light. There's a different expression there if you get close to the speed of light, um, which is revealed in special relativity. Work kinetic energy theorem says that the net work done on something by all external forces is going to be equal to the change in its kinetic energy, as long as those are all done, that, the, that work is all done by conservative forces. Otherwise, some of that work could end up going into heat. Instantaneous power is the rate of energy transfer, and this is the force dotted with the velocity of the object. So the amount of power that this force is supplying to the object is force is the value of the force dotted with velocity of the object. Now, very important to not get confused um, to distinguish between the work done by something and the work done on something. Work done by you on a box is the force of you on the box dotted with the the box dis box's displacement. Um, force of you on the box is negative the force of the box on you, so this must be negative the work that the box does on you at the same time. That's an example of conservation of energy. Up next is potential energy and conservation of energy. So a gravitational force has a potential energy function associated with it of mg times y, when you're near the Earth anyway, and for a spring we have half kx squared, where x is the equilibrium displacement, so the displacement from equilibrium, that is. Uh, let's see. A force is conservative if the work it does on a particle moving between any two points is independent of path taken between those points. So you can just take the kinetic energy at the, or the potential energy at the end, subtract the potential energy at the beginning, and know how much work was done. It doesn't matter how it got there, that's going to give you the network. Uh, also, the work it does on a particle is zero when it moves back to its initial, when it goes through any path and then comes back to where it started. That's characteristic of a conservative force. So whatever work um, you do on it will be storing potential energy and it will give that back later if you let it, maybe by dropping the thing that you raised up or by letting go of the spring that you stretched. Friction is a non-conservative force. After it acts, it doesn't store that energy in a way that you can get access to it again. It's kind of associated with the randomness in statistical mechanics that you'll see in uh, in that course, which will um, which explains how this work goes into heating up an object in kind of random microscopic kinetic energy that can't um, from the second law come back and 
re-express itself as this ordered macroscopic kinetic energy that we talk about in a mechanics course. Okay, a potential energy function is only associated with a conservative force again, and the potential energy change is the work done, let's see, the increase in potential energy is the work done on that force, right? So the work done by that force would be the decrease in its potential energy. Let's think about this. If gravity is doing positive work, it means it's acting in the direction of motion, meaning the direction of motion is down, meaning gravity would be gravity potential energy would be decreasing. So that works out. If you have a negative value here, you would have to get a negative value on this side. So this thing that you're integrating would have to be positive, and there we go. Okay, uh, let's, let's talk about this in a bit more of a vector way. If you take this integral equation and you differentiate it, then you can write it in terms of derivatives. So partial derivative of the potential energy function in a direction is negative the force associated with that potential energy function in that direction. Combining this with the other directions, you can say that a force, any conservative force, is negative the gradient of its potential energy function. This combination of vector derivatives is called a gradient. So we'll see this a lot in computational multiphysics, and it will, um, you'll, you'll experience it a fair bit in math to ZZ3 as well. Okay, so gradient of a vector field just now uh, briefly is a vector that points in the direction of the fastest increase. I should say, sorry, gradient of a scalar field. You can't take the gradient of a vector field. Well, you can sort of, but it's not called gradient then. It's called uh, divergence or curl. More on that next semester. Anyway, gradient of a scalar field is a vector field, um, a vector that is a function of position, that is, which points in the direction of the fastest increase of the scalar at that point in space. The work done by a conservative force is negative the change in the force's potential energy. So for example, gravity. Gravity's potential energy field uh, for a mass m near the surface of the Earth might be mgz. This is, the, this is a scalar field because it doesn't have a direction. But it's associated with a vector field, which is the gravitational force, negative the gradient of u, substituting in this del operator thing, because the potential energy only depends on z, we end up with a force that is only in the z direction. So the force of gravity points downward. This is a way that you could go kind of the other way that then we did in first year, where you start with what the potential energy is, and then you work out what the force has to be associated with that. Okay. So total mechanical energy would be the sum of the kinetic energy and the potential energy. And in a system where only conservative forces act on something, you don't have any energy that goes out of this frame, right? You just have energy perhaps bouncing back and forth between kinetic and potential, but the energy can't leave this system. So this is pretty useful because with no non-conservative forces, you can now answer some stuff about things like pendulums a lot more easily than you would be able to if you couldn't do it with energy. Um, so here's a question. Simple pendulum has mass m and is released with a string of length L held horizontal, what's the maximum tension in the string? Because we're talking about force, you might be tempted to jump right to force, but there's a trick going through energy. You can start off by saying, hey, uh, the initial entirely gravitational energy will be transformed into totally kinetic energy if we're using a reference point at the bottom when it's at the bottom of its arc. Uh, that tells you what the Velocity will be at the bottom by conservation of energy, setting this kinetic energy to the uh, gravitational potential energy. Solve for the velocity, and then use that in the centripetal acceleration expression to find out what the tension has to be. So at the bottom, we've got tension up minus its weight has to equal mass times its radial acceleration up in the same direction as tension because it's being 
pulled up by the string. So then solve for the tension, and we've got that it's actually 3 mg. So at the bottom of this arc, it is moving, uh, it has a tension three times higher than if it was just being held there. The other 2 mg coming from the fact that it's making this arc. Okay, so this is a challenging kind of vector calculus example here. Suppose you know that, well, like after you've done vector calculus, it won't be challenging, but it's challenging now if you haven't done math 2ZZ. So suppose you know that there is a uniform electric field between plates that gives you a force equal to this just in the x direction. Find an electron's potential energy function that's associated with this. All right, well, if F is supposed to be negative the gradient of U, meaning this, then we have sort of three equations in in um, in two unknowns, or really in, in one unknown, u. And that seems nuts, right? How do we have three equations in one unknown and not have an over-constrained system, perhaps? Well, the, the reason is because these are differential equations. So in fact, every time we do this integral, we're going to have a constant show up, and we have to kind of combine them and, and collect them together to make stuff work. So we're going to use this partial integration technique. Let's start at the end. We know that the partial of u, whatever u is, with respect to z has to be zero. So when we integrate that, we get u on the left and a constant on the right. And here's how partial integration works. You end up with a constant that could have depended on x and y. It's, it's a constant with respect to z anyway, because the partial derivative with respect to z would have killed it. But it could maybe depend on x and y. So now let's take this and substitute into the middle equation. Partial of this with respect to y is del h by del y, because u is now h at xy, which is zero from the equation up here. So then we've got that, again, um, we can solve this differential equation integrating with respect to y, and we get that h has to depend maybe just on x. So in other words, it can't depend on y. It could maybe depend on x. Uh, what about the first equation then? Del g by del x, because g is now just a function of x, the partial derivative turns into an ordinary derivative, which gives us after one integral, that g at x is negative f times x plus c. So you can't actually solve for this c, but with most potential energy definitions, it's arbitrary. You can pick that c at whatever you like, and it will still work out. It'll do everything you need to from a force perspective of the, f that is that the force will still be equal to negative the gradient of this potential energy. Okay, up next is a block and a turnpike problem. Um, the notes actually do solve this, but it is a monster of a problem. There's some ways to do it that are way easier than others. And the point is not quite to solve it exactly. The point is to show how to set it up and um, and what the challenges are with trying to solve it with the, the traditional approaches you would have used in first year physics. So basically the idea is you start with this block up here on this arc. And the trick is that it's not a frictionless arc, right? It has friction. And the question is, posed kind of simply, with friction, where does it first come to rest? So it's going to, maybe it, you know, slides down and then stops here. Maybe it slides and then starts sliding up a bit and then stops, right? And then whenever it stops, the maybe harder secondary version of this is once it first stops, does it start moving again, or does the static friction manage to hold it still for the rest of time? Maybe it comes a, up a little bit here and then stops and ends up here, right? Only if there's no static friction, or if the coefficient of static friction is the same as kinetic, would you expect it to actually stop right in the middle? Yeah? Um, otherwise, maybe that's it could just be a coincidence. But if static friction is much larger than kinetic friction, as is the case here, then it's probably not going to stop in the middle. It's going to stop somewhere close down, maybe here, maybe closer in, after it comes to rest the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, etc. time. All right, so let's talk about it. Because mechanical energy is not conserved, you uh, have some difficulty in dealing with it with energy. 
So the energy approach needs you to keep track of the energy that was lost to friction. And this ends up being a very tricky and difficult thing to do once you have it sort of moving down part of the way and um, <laughs> compounded by the fact that the friction force is a different magnitude as you move along. Why is that? Well, as it moves down, it speeds up, right? And because it's speeding up, it has a higher um, velocity and therefore needs more centripetal acceleration to move in this arc path. And that means the normal force has to be higher and that increases the friction. So as it moves down, it gets higher friction force as it's, as it's moving faster as more in the, of the gravitational potential energy is transferred into kinetic energy. So this is really quite complicated to set up in energy. Um, amazing if you can make it through and get to the setup of the problem. But please consider this uh, working through this as a challenge. Uh, let's go on. So once you've got this as the differential equation, where W is this temporary definition of V squared to make the thing a little bit easier and note that it's a first order linear differential equation in W, you can then solve it with the techniques that you learn in math uh, to Z03, but it's a very difficult integral to do um, that you can then figure out numerically and find out where it comes to a, to a stop first. So part way up the ramp on the other side. Um, then you can check whether it gets stuck at that point and find out that yes, it does halt due to static friction once it gets, uh, once it first comes to a stop there. Uh, but rather than solving this differential equation manually, you can have Maple solve it for you if you tell it all of the values of the constants. Then solving this differential equation with Maple not so bad using the desolve command. And can plot what the uh, W looks like, W being the velocity squared term plotted here versus angle. So we start at pi by two, and then we're actually decreasing in angle as the velocity squared increases until it comes to a stop around this spot over here. So that's the solution they're looking for, which after you use the, uh, the F solve, you can confirm is the same as this angle here for the, that uh, that we found. Okay, but most of the time in this course, we're not going to want to do it this energy way because the whole reason to go into energy is if it simplifies things um, in the setup of the problem. But this problem is so complicated with the energy loss to friction that that doesn't simplify things. So we'd rather solve it just by sticking with force. Let's see what that looks like. So this, the, the force formulation rather than energy means we keep track of acceleration and we'll say that the radial force is the normal force minus mg cos theta, which is the part of the weight which is still for this definition of theta um, going away from the radial direction. And this is equal to mass times the radial acceleration, which has to be mv squared over r and the tangential force, the force, uh, the net force down the ramp would be mg sine theta minus the friction force. And this has to equal m times the tangential acceleration. So we can substitute in the fact that this radius is a constant and just rewrite the velocity as r times omega, the angular velocity kind of down around this circular arc, and also the angular acceleration being the second derivative of that position. So this is the angular acceleration down around that arc. Now, once we've got these forms in their angular versions, we're in a good position to solve this first one for the normal force, subs that into the friction definition, and get a single equation that is a differential equation for theta. So what would that be? That would be that alpha here, theta double dot, is equal to coefficient of kinetic friction times theta prime squared 
plus g over r cos theta minus g over r sine theta. So this is a very nonlinear equation. This is why the energy setup would normally be the way to do it. This setup is much shorter than, um, than this setup up here. But the reward for doing this long version setup and being clever with this W substitution is we get a linear differential equation here that's simple to solve in something like maple. Whereas down here, we have a very nonlinear differential equation. You've got theta's, theta prime squared. You've got cos and sine of theta happening. Very nonlinear. But flex PDE doesn't care about that. You could just, uh, since flex is solving it numerically, taking one time step and then recalculating another time step, recalculating, um, you first write this second order differential equation in terms of two coupled first order differential equations by defining, as we did above, omega as the derivative of theta. And then we're going to end up with this thing that we can substitute into the equations in flex PDE, keeping in mind that theta at zero is pi by two, omega at zero is uh, zero. So I think I might have said earlier that omega and theta, omega and alpha were the angular acceleration down the ramp. That's not quite true. They're the derivatives of theta, which means um, that omega is, is technically the angular velocity up the ramp, but omega squared still ends up being the same thing here. Okay. So in flex PDE, we have these same equations typed up here. If you followed the basic flex thing, you can try to incorporate this yourself and see where this comes up, where this comes from, or you can just put it into flex manually. Let's do that. Run it. And we have a stop at which angle, negative 0.527, which is the same as we found using a much more complicated energy formulation. So flex by being a numeric solver is able to solve this nonlinear differential equation without any trouble because it doesn't try to solve it in an analytical sense. It just says, I'm gonna take the current values for theta that I have, put it in, see what the change in these variables is. Step one time step to the future, like maybe one nanosecond into the future, recalculate. Step a nanosecond into the future, recalculate. Use the When it steps into the future, it uses the derivatives to guess what the new values will be. The idea is if you take a small enough time step, then, the, uh, then these functions are going to be essentially linear, right? With a small enough time step, the derivative will tell you what the value will be later if you know the value right now. So that's why you need an initial condition, calculate the derivatives, take one step in time forward and, and say that for a small enough time step, we're then going to know what the new values are by these plus that time step times the slope. Now, it's not something that we're going to do, but uh, Maple actually can solve things numerically as well using numeric desolve. The way to do that is by, at least in the old version of Maple that I have, setting the numeric option to uh, as, as an argument in desolve, and then it is able to get through this, this crazy nonlinear differential equation that we found out by using the, fourth, the, the force method. Okay, a bunch of quick topics here at the end. Almost made it. Uh, a lot of these are included largely just to keep, um, to, just for completion's sake, that they are important in general in physics, but not going to be that important in this course in particular. So linear momentum is the mass times the velocity. It's a vector. And impulse is the change in momentum. This uh, tells you uh, sort of the average force that was delivered over a given amount of time. When you've got a collision, then there's a very short time with very uh, spiky, like large forces delivered over a very short amount of time, uh, over that very short amount of time. So normally you don't want to talk about it in terms of the force since that's complicated and changing, you would deal with the impulse. And impulse being the integral of that vector force over the time 
uh, that you're talking about, usually the time of a collision, is the change in momentum. Now, even though this is applied to collisions, typically it's true in general, the time integral of the force acting on something is the change in that thing's momentum. This is the impulse momentum theorem. Collisions can be categorized in terms of their elasticity. So a perfectly inelastic collision means that the bodies stick together afterwards. An elastic collision is one where kinetic energy is conserved. Um, this is not really an approximation. This can really happen. This is typically an approximation unless you're dealing with a conservative sort of non-contact force and there's um, and maybe you're at absolute zero in a vacuum and all that. Anyway, in two or three dimensional collisions, and everything's a superconductor also. Everything, the, the, basically, this is an ideal situation, but it's a good approximation in a lot of real situations. Uh, okay, now there's also an inelastic collision in general, which is one where the total kinetic energy is not conserved. Center of mass is the average position weighted by the mass. So here's how you do an average. You add up all of the masses of individual particles multiplied by their position, then divide by the total mass. If you don't have discrete particles, you could instead integrate over a continuous object. So integrate over all the pieces of it, the little bits of mass of that infinitesimal piece multiplied by its vector position, add up all those as vectors, in doing this integral. Integral means sum, right? So you would add up all those infinitesimal masses multiplied by the vectors of their location, then divide by the total mass, and that would give you the coordinate of the center of mass. Similarly, you could find the velocity of the center of mass by adding up all the velocities of the different particles multiplied by their mass, and then divide out the total mass. What's interesting about this one is this doesn't even require all the things to have the same velocity. A lot of the time, an object would have all of its constituent parts at the same velocity, but not always, right? Like if you're moving somewhere, maybe you're moving, like you're you really, we say your center of mass is moving there, but perhaps your arms have different velocities if you're swinging them while you're walking, uh, or your legs will have instantaneous different velocities if you're, if you're walking there. And maybe the blood in your system is moving at, in some places, pretty, fa pretty fast velocities in all kinds of different directions at once. But we don't have to worry about that because we can just deal with the center of mass's velocity uh, as the as the thing that we use for our physics. Now using this, you dealt with questions like this in first year. If you have two astronauts and one of them is holding a tank and then he pushes the tank to the other astronaut um, and we know the speed of the tank, then you can use conservation of momentum to find out uh, what the final velocity is of the other astronaut. You can also sort out that the rate of change of linear momentum is the rate of change of mv. And if m is constant, then this tells you ma is equal to the force. So force is also equal to rate of change of momentum is another way that you can write Newton's second law. In case, you know, f equals ma is too mainstream for you. From these sorts of setups, you can solve things like this cart problem. If it fires a cannonball, the momentum of the cart cannonball system is conserved in what direction? Well, momentum is always conserved. Uh, but, but what system are we talking about? So the momentum of the, of a closed system has to be conserved. And is the cart cannonball system cart cannon cannonball system closed in the vertical direction? Well, no, because when it fires, the earth puts a force on it. So there's an external force from the earth acting on it, which means it's not conserved in the vertical direction, but there's no forces on in the horizontal direction. So this system only conserves momentum in the horizontal direction. Using conservation of momentum and energy at different times, you can solve all kinds of crazy collision problems. Like suppose that we've got Tarzan 
initially horizontal and then swings down and inelastically collides with Jane down here and then they swing up to a different height. So what height do they swing to? Um, is energy conserved? Well, no, it's not conserved in an inelastic collision, but what you can say is that momentum is conserved. So the idea is you use conservation of energy for this part to find out Tarzan's speed when he hits Jane there, and then you use conservation of momentum to find out their speed after the collision, and then conservation of energy again to find the final height. There's some uh, solution here to walk you through that if, you, if you'd like. I really suggest, by the way, solving things in arbitrary variables as much as you can, because then you get to, at the end, do things like this, experiment around mentally and say all right what is what how's this going to work out if tarzan's mass is much greater than jane's ah then the final height is equal to the initial height makes sense if you know this wasn't jane but maybe a, a speck of dust you'd expect that tarzan would go back up to the final same height what if tarzan is much less mass than jane then we end up with this going to zero so that means it's a brick wall down here. Smack. Not so good of a time for Tarzan. Okay, other other things you can do. Um, substituting in same mass, then they happen to move up to a height of R over 4. Kind of interesting. Tells you about how much energy is lost in that situation. So these are the things you can do if you solve it with variables at the end. Um, yeah, so Spring, Spring Zan and Jane. Uh, here, Spring Zan is like Tarzan, but it's just covered with springs, so collides elastically. Figure out how this works. It's it's not going to be going back up to the same height because now Jane is going to spring off of this and, and move forward. Maybe not a, uh, a great experience. I don't know. Uh, whatever whatever you're into, I suppose. So Springs Anne here uh, slams into Jane at the bottom, and Jane flies off in that direction. How does that work? Well, with an elastic collision, now we have the other equation that energy is conserved, and we can uh, sort out two different possibilities. When you go and solve this, you find that one option is that after the collision, Spring Zan has the initial velocity and Jane isn't moving. That means he missed, right? He just continued on forward there. Another option is this neat thing that depends on the balance of their masses, how it's going to work. If Jane has a much greater mass than Spring Zan, then uh, Spring Zan ends up moving in the opposite direction. This is just negative the initial velocity, and this is basically zero because the big the little m dominates the big M. On the other hand, if they're equal, then Spring Zan stops and only Jane flies off in that direction. At the initial velocity that Spring Zan had, because then these cancel with the 2m up there. If, on the other hand, the little m is much less than big M, then something pretty neat happens, which is this is just the initial velocity, but this one is twice the velocity. So if you have a when a when a wall moves and hits dust particles, the dust particles bounce off at twice the relative velocity of the wall uh, in order for momentum to be conserved from this collision. Yeah. So if something's rotating, then uh, we have angular mechanics, which we've actually been dealing with a fair bit already, uh, for objects moving on curved trajectories. So it's also, it's applicable if something's rotating or if it's just moving along a curved path and you might be able to define an angle around that circular path uh, the angular velocity is the derivative of that and then angular acceleration as the derivative of that then you can derive the same kinds of kinematic equations which again in this situation only work for constant angular acceleration um, there's an equivalent linear quantity for all the angular ones so arc length is r times the angular displacement, the velocity, the linear velocity is r omega, tangential acceleration is r alpha, and then we already had radial acceleration v squared over r. Now the equivalent of mass for rotational motion is really the moment of inertia. Moment of inertia is like your resistance to rotational motion. This is the sum of all the different pieces of this this object 
uh, the their mass times their square distance from the rotational axis. This is moment of inertia. If it's a continuous object, you really should use an integral again. So this is adding up all the little bits of mass times the square of their r distance from the rotational axis. And using moment of inertia, you can, like mass, define a kinetic energy, but this time it's rotational kinetic energy. Spinning things have energy too. Uh, if momentum is the ability to move you, then energy maybe is the ability to um, to damage or, or hurt you perhaps. So like a bullet has a lot of kinetic energy compared to its momentum. Um, if you compare that to like a, um, a slow moving snowplow, snowplow has a much higher momentum compared to kinetic energy. So if the snowplow hits you, you're going to move. If the bullet hits you, it's going to not knock you back as much as the snowplow would, but it is going to be breaking chemical bonds uh, more effectively than the snowplow, and that's not a fun experience. Okay, so similarly, a spinning saw blade can also do things like a bullet can do. It's kind of violent in the collisions section all the time, isn't it? Anyway, uh, and that, not surprisingly, has some kinetic energy associated with it too. So half I omega squared is your rotational kinetic energy. What about force? The equivalent to force is torque. So torque is force times displacement as long as the displacement is distance from the axis of rotation here and the force is applied at a 90 degree angle. Otherwise you would have to use a cross product. So what about this? This is Newton's second law for angular motion. The net torque is equal to the moment of inertia times the angular acceleration. One thing useful for calculating moments of inertia about different points than the center of mass is the parallel axis theorem. The moment of inertia about some point other than the center of mass, spinning about an axis that's parallel to an axis through the center of mass, is the moment of inertia about that center of mass plus the total mass times the square of the distance away that we are. So you could use this rather than having to totally recalculate the moment of inertia about this new axis position for an object, if you know the moment of inertia about the center of mass, and for some reason you need to rotate it about a different axis that's parallel to that axis, you could just add the total mass times the square of the distance between the axes to get the new moment of inertia. As you can see, this is always going to be larger than the moment of inertia about the center of uh, the, the axis through the center of mass. So for power, just like we had force times velocity, in angular motion, torque times the angular velocity is going to give you power. Um, for conservation of energy, we have that the net work done on something, if it's all gone into rotational kinetic energy, then you can say that it's the difference between the final and initial rotational kinetic energies. Okay, a few practice problems. If you have a couple of masses that are spinning at a constant angular velocity, then you can use the angular velocity to sort out what the radial acceleration is, and then say that that's provided by the tensions. Using their not necessarily equal masses, you can then sort out what the tension ratio has to be um, for this particular system. You could also try this problem where you're finding the moment of inertia through the diagonal and then through the top left particle through a parallel axis, again using the parallel axis theorem because this is a parallel axis to this first one. For a distributed mass, you can deal with figuring out moment of inertia by doing that integral formula that we had there. So what's the moment of inertia about one end of this? Then you find the familiar one-third ml squared as the result. Through the center of mass, it's a twelfth ml squared. And finally, moment of inertia uh, for a solid cylinder. This is another one of those things that you um, you often just look up if you need it, but let's derive it for now. So what is the moment of inertia about this central axis of this cylinder? We can set up a little bit of mass in a little ring here would be uh, the density times a little bit of volume, and the little bit of volume would be the circumference of this, 2 pi r, dr, 
times the length of the cylinder in and out of the page. So integrating that with respect to R, integrating R squared with respect to that, that is, to actually integrate it, you substitute in dm. So now it's in the same variable as you had here. And you know the range on R that will take you from the center to the edge of this. So after doing this, it's an integral of R cubed. And we have R4, R to the 4 over 4 after subbing in the outer radius, which simplifies out to something you can factor and, turn, and put in and recognize as the total mass of the cylinder to get half m big R squared. Okay, so now uh, what if it's not solid but has an interior radius R in? Then we could put in R in as the lower bound and find out that it's the difference of these things to the power of 4. And after a little bit of work, you can find out what the mass is of this and then factor out the mass and again express it as half m big R squared plus inner R squared. Now this seems kind of nuts, right? If you look at this version of the expression, it looks like it's bigger than this. But why would hollowing out the cylinder increase its moment of inertia? It doesn't. What's not obvious from this version and this version is that the mass went down here, right? You can see that um, in this version. So expressed at this step, um, oh, sorry, this is the mass. Expressed at this step here, you can tell that the bigger the inner radius, the lower the uh, moment of inertia. So if we hollow out some of the interior of the cylinder, the moment of inertia goes down. So there's another example here. This is a block on a frictionless ramp, uh, but it's um, being held back by this pulley that does have friction in it. You're told what the acceleration is of the block, two meters per second squared down the ramp, and you know the block's mass. You don't know the pulley's mass or its moment of inertia. You do know its radius, um, and you know the angle of the ramp, and you know that the pulley has a frictional torque acting on it of 0.4 Newton meters. So let's do this setup. You're asked to find the tension in the rope and the moment of inertia of the wheel. What we can say, thanks to the help of this free body diagram, is that the force on the block down the ramp is equal to its mass times its acceleration. And we know its acceleration. And the force down the ramp on this thing is going to be equal to mg sine theta minus the tension. On the pulley though, we could write an angular version of this Newton second law, right? So on the pulley, we'll say the rotation in this direction, I alpha, moment of inertia times that angular acceleration is equal to the net torque in that direction. Torque uh, let's say out of the page using the right-hand rule. And that's going to be equal to um, T times R minus this frictional torque. So this is one equation. This is another equation. How many unknowns do we have? We know A, we know M, we don't know I, we're asked to solve for that. We don't know tension, and we don't know alpha, but we can find alpha. So alpha r is equal to a is the last piece that ties this together. The angular acceleration in this out of the page direction is equal to the linear acceleration down the ramp divided by the radius. So that means that we've got enough equations to be able to solve for um, the things that we don't know here. So there's the setup. The solution is written down here. You can manually solve this or use a computer algebra system and end up with a moment of inertia equaling r squared m g over a sine 35 minus 1 um, minus r over a times tau friction. Now for me, I'm not sure why, but these fancy uh, boxes that I spent a lot of time 
that we spend a lot of time over the summer making for people seem to be all misplaced once in a while when I'm working with this file. I don't know if that's the case for you too. Maybe it's just this one, but what seems to fix it is trying to resize it and then immediately undoing that action. And then they go back to this nice um, rescaled, like automatically sized thing that will rescale to the width of the screen as you uh, resize the, the window or the page. So like always, whenever we have a, a, a solution like this, we want to check what it means. Um, if the torque that's from friction on this wheel is larger, it would mean that the moment of inertia must be smaller. Um, why is that? Well, if the block is sliding down at this certain acceleration, then it must be it could be slowed down because of this size of this moment of inertia. Like the energy is going into delivering more uh, rotational kinetic energy to this if this moment of inertia is larger. Or it could be because there's just too much frictional torque here. The energy is going into friction in this. So that explains why the friction and the um, is is kind of opposing and reducing the moment of inertia. With more friction, there wouldn't have been as much of the energy going into moment of inertia there. Okay, so total kinetic energy is the linear plus rotational kinetic energy, which is especially useful if the object is rolling because then you can relate the linear and rotational velocity by saying that the rotational velocity times the radius has to be the linear velocity. Uh, okay, the force applied a distance r away, a displacement r away from the rotation axis, technically tr produces a torque which is again the cross product of r cross f, where cross product is of any two vectors is defined as this vector operation. It's a way to multiply vectors and get a vector. Um, you can find out the direction of the result using the right hand rule. It's going to have a magnitude that's equal to the product of the original vector's magnitude times the sine of the angle between them. This is useful to understand. This is useful to understand. You really need both because you want to think through it this way a lot of the time. But for calculating, it's often faster to go through the, the vector method, the, the, um, the algebraic, let's say linear algebra method. Actually, I guess it's all linear algebra. Let's say the matrix method, the component method. Okay, so to do it in, to take a cross product of vectors and components, you lay out one as a row and then another one as the other row and put the unit vectors up at the top. Then do cofactor expansion on this determinant to say, hey, that's going to be i times this determinant, 2 times 4 minus 3 times 0, um, minus j times the determinant of this and this, or in other words, j times 3 times 2 minus j times 1 times 4, 3, 2 minus 1, 4, and then k times this determinant, 1 times 0 minus 2 times 2. Okay. By the way, whenever you set up a coordinate system, you can check that you've done it right-handed by seeing if i cross j is equal to k. That's something that's easy to miss until you until you really think about it and need to draw axes yourself, like you'll have to in this course. X cross Y needs to be equal to Z for a lot of the stuff that we're doing that relies on cross product to work out. So you could break these cross products. Whenever you have R cross F, it's helpful to break F into forces parallel to R and forces perpendicular to R because then you can say the parallel component creates no torque and the perpendicular component is going to have a magnitude that's just the the product of these magnitudes. Angular momentum is R cross momentum. So for some um, displacement relative to the axis you're calculating the angular momentum the object has about, uh, and it's linear momentum p, you can take that axis, displacement to the point where the object is, cross that with the momentum, and you've got the angular momentum. This is um, normally a lot more straightforward for objects that are, that are rotating about a fixed point, but technically you can calculate lin uh, angular momentum 
even if they're not. If they're just moving past a post, you can find the angular momentum that they have about that post. And interestingly, it's still conserved even in that straight line situation. It's non-zero and conserved um, in situations where it's not just rotating about a central axis. This completes the equivalence to linear motion with just like force is the time derivative of momentum, torque ends up being time derivative of angular momentum. So we can make a table here that compares the linear and angular quantities. And there's a little link here that shows you how they're related with a, a nice little animation here. As you have an object moving around with different, uh, different forces in blue, that speed it up and slow it down. You can see how the linear momentum here in green will increase with time and then hold still when you stop um, putting the force on it. Technically, the momentum vector is changing with another force, which is the fact that this is on this rod pulling it towards the center. The angular momentum by the right hand rule is going to be in a perpendicular plane to where this vector is r from the axis we're finding the angular momentum about to the location where, uh, where the object is. So angular momentum is going to increase and then decrease and go the other way as the object starts moving in the opposite direction. Torque, this pale blue thing, is applied only when the force is applied. That's when we have a torque about this. You can see that looking at the torque in time is going to be increasing the angular momentum in that direction or decreasing it away if it's in the opposite direction. So torque here, decrease it, increase it that way, torque there, decrease it back down. Let's imagine we have a pencil that is upright on a desk and it's allowed to fall over. As it rotates, is the angular acceleration constant increasing or decreasing? Well, angular acceleration multiplied by moment of inertia is equal to the torque and the torque is going to be larger when the pencil is closer to the ground right because this if you imagine that this is the fixed base point that it's pivoting about uh, then as the pencil falls over we have a closer to 90 degree angle between the weight through the center of mass and the uh, the displacement the r from the pivot point to that center of mass. So R cross weight gets larger as it rotates, meaning the torque gets larger, so this is not a constant angular acceleration situation. Two astronauts are floating freely in space joined by a rope of length 15 meters. Each has a mass of 70 kilograms, but one of them has this 50 kilogram pack, and they're rotating at one RPM. Then they're gonna gather the rope so that instead of 15 meters, it's only 10 meters long. How long does it take to complete a revolution now? Okay, so technically we have to be careful about where the center of mass is and then find the moment of inertia before and after they gather this rope. So the center of mass relative to, let's say the left astronaut as the x equals zero point has this coordinate by adding up mx over adding up m. This is like a weighted average x position based on the the mass that's another way to say the calculation of center of mass so then the moment of inertia is the sum of mass times the position minus this center of mass squared and conveniently after you work this through you find um, once substituting this into there that the moment of inertia is proportional to l squared just like usual it's proportional to the size of this thing squared, even though there's complications with the center of mass moving around as they gather in the rope, it's still proportional to the overall separation distance squared, which means it's easy for us to now substitute into this expression and see that, well, angular momentum is conserved. So I omega before has to be I omega after. And to find the final omega, we can solve this so we end up with a ratio of i so you don't actually want to calculate the moment of inertia before and after we just needed how it was changing with l since all of the masses are constant we can then turn this into a ratio of l's 
So I1 over I2 is L1 over L2 squared. Substituting in 15 over 10 will show us how much the angular velocity has to increase if the length has decreased. And it goes up to 9 fourths of what it originally was, which means that the period is going to be 4 ninths what it originally was, less than half of the, uh, the minute that it used to take to do this revolution. Okay, so now finally we have the last example of this video. A thin ring is going to roll without slipping at 2 meters per second along a level floor and then go up this ramp. So this is thin, which means the moment of inertia is just mr squared. Uh, if it's rolling without slipping, we can relate the angular and the linear velocity and say omega is equal to v over r, which lets us put everything in terms of just v. After simplifying this together, the r squared cancels with that r squared, and we've got an mv squared. So half mv squared, half mv squared, it ends up just being mv squared plus mgy for the energy expression. Since there's no loss to friction from the lack of slipping here, and we're going to ignore the losses of rolling friction in this problem, as we always did in first year, the energy is going to be mv squared plus mgy at all points. So once we've increased up a certain height, then we're going to have a decreased velocity ending up just like these kinematic problems before, except instead of 2gh, we have just gh because we didn't have the half in front of the mv squared. Wow. If you're still listening to this and you actually made it through all that and worked through those problems, you're my hero. I'm so proud of you. Please go and watch this Veritasium block experiment to help think through this stuff. It's you won't be disappointed. It's a, it's only a minute and a half long. It's, uh, it, it, although it does lead into some other videos that ask you to think about how this worked. Thanks so much for your time. See you next time.